First, uh, as we get started here, I want to acknowledge uh, some of the office holders that are here. Um, I want to first start with uh, Janet Byhoffer, our Republican National Committee woman. Janet. Thank you very much for being here tonight, Janet. And uh, Representative Steve Draskowski. Uh, next, uh, Cindy Pugh, Representative Cindy Pugh. Our local uh, representative, uh, Representative Kelly Fenton. <laughs> Kelly's in the back. Thank you, Kelly. And uh, Greg Lomer. Greg, uh, Kathy Lomer uh, is, is, is trying to get here. So uh, her husband, Greg Lomer, is here. Thank you, Greg, for being here. Did I miss anybody? Anybody slip in that we, we've invited a, a slate of folks and many tri people were trying to get here? So uh, flag me down even midway if I've forgotten anybody. Thank you. Well, um, I'm going to introduce the introducer, but uh, first I want to say when, when we uh, finish the program, we're going to have kind of a hard stop at 8.30. Uh, Pastor Raphael and his, uh, his aide from the campaign have been traveling hard. They got in here late last night. They have to get up at 3.30 in the morning uh, to take their next flight out. And so we uh, are just very thankful to have them here. So we'll probably let them exit quickly at, uh, at 8, 8, 8.30. But uh, just to make that note quickly now uh, before we get started. So I'd like to introduce uh, Representative Steve Draskowski, who we will introduce Raphael Cruz. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me here today uh, to uh, introduce a very important and compelling person. Uh, you will. Uh, some of us had a chance to meet him earlier, and I, I, you'll have, uh, I'm certain, the same uh, glowing response to uh, meeting this uh, wonderful individual that I did. Um, in this day and age, when we are looking at a presidential campaign that is reminding us of where we came from and what this country was supposed to be about. In a day when we are looking at the frustrations with special interests being held up over the people and the need for that to be flipped around. In a day when we are looking at government becoming bigger and bigger and the family becoming smaller and smaller, we are looking for that to be turned around and the family to be bigger and bigger and our government to become smaller and smaller. The Rafael was born in Matanzas, Cuba, uh, after uh, he worked to strongly uh, resist communism in Cuba. He fled to the United States at the age of 18 years old. He landed then in, Houston, in Austin, Texas, with about $100 to his name and little English in his vocabulary at the time. He graduated from college in 1961. He's a father of Texas Senator and presidential candidate, Ted Cruz. And he's a grandfather of two wonderful granddaughters, ages five through seven, that uh, we could just hear the very uh, strong uh, affection in his voice for as he told us about them. He travels throughout the United States advocating on behalf of his son in the campaign, working to build the campaign and be a team builder, an out front person in each of the states that he goes to. And an interesting tidbit before I uh, bring him in, uh, he told us how Ted memorized the U.S. Constitution at 13 years old and then went throughout the country to uh, recite it and meaning behind it 80 different times. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you the father, uh, uh, Rafael Cruz, the father of uh, Senator Ten Ted Cruz, and the father of the future president, the United States of America. It is such an honor and a pleasure to be with you here in Minnesota. And actually, it started as a beautiful morning, bright sunshine, and I'm enjoying the great 50 degree weather. We don't have the hot and muggy weather I left behind in Texas, so it's been great. Great to be here with you. 
And uh, <clears throat> I was telling someone a little while ago, you know, I remember when Reagan got elected that we had such an overwhelming sweep that the map was all red, against, <laughs> except for a little speck of blue. <laughs> And we need to redeem that little yeah. speck of blue. Yeah. And Minnesotans can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as, as you heard, I grew up in a very oppressive military dictatorship. As a result, I was involved in the revolution, was imprisoned, tortured, but by the grace of God, I was able to leave Cuba in 1957 and come to America I remember during that time, there was this young charismatic leader talking about hope and change. His name was Fidel Castro, and we all followed him, thinking that he was going to be our liberator. Little did we know. Well, after he took over, I went back to Cuba in 1959. And this same guy that had talked about hope and change was now talking about how the rich were evil, about how they oppressed the poor, and about the need to redistribute the wealth began attacking freedom of the press, began attacking freedom of religion, began confiscating private property. So after three weeks, I left Cuba, never to return again, but so happy to be in the land of the free, the home of the brave, the greatest country on the face of the earth. Yeah. I'm so proud to be in the Let me tell you, America is absolutely the greatest country on earth. How dare our president say America is not an exceptional country? Yeah. This is the most exceptional country in the world. It's the country where with hard work and perseverance, all your dreams can become a reality. And you know, America has such a great, great heritage. I'll tell you. I uh, went to school in Austin, Texas, at the University of Texas, graduated there, and Six years later, I had my own business in oil and gas exploration. And then in the late 70s, I was shocked again when I saw a government in this country begin to institute policies that reminded me of that bearded dictator I left behind in Cuba. Some of you may remember the Carter years, 22% interest rates, double-digit inflation, double-digit unemployment, lines around the block to get gasoline. A government so weak in foreign policy that Iran had captured 52 Americans and held them hostage for 444 days. Well, because of that, I became very involved with an organization called the Religious Roundtable. It was a group of Judeo-Christian believers that we mobilized millions of people of faith across America to help elect whom I consider the greatest president since Abraham Lincoln, President Ronald Reagan. I remember <clears throat> 1980, my son had just turned nine years old. Our conversation around the dinner table every day for a year was about why we had to get rid of this socialist progressive Jimmy Carter <laughs> and replace him with a constitutional conservative like Ronald Reagan. So my son, Ted, got a dose of conservative politics <laughs> every day for a year when he was nine years old. <laughs> and then when he turned 13, we introduced him to an organization called the Free Enterprise Institute. Ted had just turned 13. He's reading Adam Smith and John Locke and Von Mises and Hayek and Bastiak and Montesquieu and Milton Friedman and the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers. And then this organization created a group of five kids. They called them the Constitutional Corroborators. <laughs> they hired a memory expert and taught these five kids, my son Ted was one of them, to memorize the entire US Constitution. For the next four years, they traveled to the state of Texas. They would go to a luncheon meeting, normally a Rotary Club or something like that, they would put five easels in the front of the room, and while people were having lunch, they would write the Constitution by memory on those easels, and then give a half-hour patriotic speech 
on free market economics and the Constitution. During the next four years, they did approximately 80 speeches on free market economics and the Constitution. Before my son left high school, he was passionate about the Constitution. He was passionate about the Declaration, about free markets, about limited government, about the rule of law. And that passion became like fire in his bones. And let me tell you, the reason I know that my son Ted Cruz will not compromise his principles in Washington is that fire is as alive today as it was over 30 years ago. And anyways, I'll tell you, we are at a point of crisis in America. Amen. We have had the worst administration since the birth of this republic. If we do not turn this country around in this election, we're going to have to kiss this country goodbye. I must have told my son dozens of times, you know, Ted, when I lost my freedom in Cuba, I had a place to come to. If we lose our freedoms here, where are we going to go? There is no place to go. That's why we have to fight to restore this nation. Because I'll tell you what, if we don't do that, our children and our children's children will not have a future. I lost my freedom once. I'm not willing to lose it again. I will die fighting before I lose it again, and so should you. you know, I now, I'll tell you, the battle is not November of 2016. The battle is the primary. Unfortunately, the Republican establishment tells us that we need a middle of the road moderate as our standard bearer. Over the last 40 years, every time we've had a mushy moderate that stands for nothing, we've lost. We lost with uh, with, with, well, all the way back to Dole and Gerald Ford and George H.W. in 92, because remember in 88, he ran as the third term of Ronald Reagan. But then he ran as a moderate in 92 and lost. We lost with McCain. We lost with Romney. If we have another mushy, middle-of-the-road moderate like Jeb Bush in 2016, we will lose because the millions that stayed at home in 2008 and 2012 will stay at home again. And if Hillary is the next president of the United States of America, America will be gone. So the battle is the primary. I'll tell you, we have a lot of good candidates in this primary. I believe we have one exceptional candidate that stands head and shoulders above the rest. And I'll tell you why I believe that. We have to look beyond the rhetoric. It's very interesting. You look at the debates and you have a dozen people standing on the, on the debate platform. They all sound that they are to the right of Ronald Reagan. Every one of them is what my son calls campaign conservatives. They're going to tell you what you want to hear. All of them will tell you what you want to hear. They'll tickle your ears. We need to look beyond the rhetoric and look at the record. Don't believe what any politician tells you. Look at what they have done and look what they, what they do. Jesus put it this way. Ye shall know them by their fruit. It's about time we do some fruit checking. <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, they all have a record. So I'll tell you what. If you want to look at someone who's been leading, not just on one issue, but on every issue, you look at, for example, 
Back when my son was on that 22-hour filibuster against Obamacare. Do you remember what the Republican establishment was doing? What Mitch McConnell was screaming? Ted Cruz shut down the government. Ted Cruz is going to cost us seats in the Senate, cost us seats in the House, cost us to keep Harry Reid as majority leader. I'll tell you what happened as a result of that filibuster on Obamacare. The discourse on Obamacare got so elevated that the percentage of people against Obamacare increased dramatically. We had over 2 million people sign on to donfunded.com. Jim DeMint and Ted and I, we toured the country doing a seri series of meetings around the country on elevating the discourse on Obamacare. What happened? In 2014, we had the biggest Republican sweep we've had <laughs> since the 1920s. And every one of those that won ran on what? On defunding Obamacare. It was Ted Cruz that elevated that discourse to allow all those people to win in that unprecedented sweep. So Ted Cruz didn't shut down the government. And anyway, the shutting down the government didn't hurt us. It was the catalyst that gave us that sweep. Whether it is fighting for the First Amendment rights of free speech, or for the First Amendment rights of freedom of religion, my son has been at the forefront of protecting freedom of religion in America, which is under attack. Whether it is protecting the Second Amendment rights to keep and bear arms, let me tell you, my son has been at the forefront of protecting the Second Amendment. Back when the Heller decision was taking place in Washington, D.C., my son led a coalition of 31 states before the Supreme Court and won on the Heller decision. When Newtown occurred, Ted was a member of the minority party when the Newtown massacre occurred. The Republican leadership was saying in the Senate, gun control is inevitable. There's nothing we can do about it. My son, as the member of the minority party in committee won that battle. Some of you may remember his exchange against Dianne Feinstein, who was the one that was spearheading all the gun control legislation. He tore down her arguments so effectively that she lost her marbles and began screaming, I'm not a sixth grader. And as a result of that, zero passed on gun control. He did that as a member of the minority party. As a matter of fact, the NRA awarded Ted the highest award they give for the strongest defender of our right to keep and bear arms. Whether it is fighting to cut down the size, power, and scope of the federal government and restore those powers back to the states. Whether it is fighting to try to destroy this horrible deal with Iran that Barack Obama has made. You know, I'll tell you what, Barack Obama and what's his name, Big Face, you know, oh, this is either this deal or war. It is exactly the opposite. This deal guarantees war. This deal guarantees war because it guarantees that Iran will get the bomb. And if they get the bomb, they will use it, not only against Israel, but also against us. It also guarantees that Iran continues to build ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. They don't need an ICBM to bomb, bomb Israel. Any little rocket will do. They only need ICBMs for one reason, and that's to bomb us. What Obama and Kerry have done is they have violated their oath of office. They promised to protect the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, 
foreign and domestic. They violated that, that oath. That's right. <laughs> and they guarantee war. I'll tell you what my son have said. Day one of a Ted Cruz presidency, this Iran deal will be torn to shred and he will ring both sides <laughs> on Iran. Right. Another thing that my son has said he will do day one, all these unconstitutional, unlawful executive orders that Barack Obama has made will be rescinded day one with one, one executive order. He will tear down the IRS code and replace it with a low flat tax and dismantle the IRS. He will remove and get rid of the thousands upon thousands of regulations of the APA and OSHA and all those organizations that are strangling small businesses in America. If you get rid of taxes and regulations, and you allow Americans to keep more money in their pocket, it will unleash the entrepreneurial spirit of America to where private individuals will start creating new businesses and creating millions of jobs and restore opportunity and jobs in America. You know, we saw it in 1980. When Reagan took power, under Carter, average GDP was 1.1% a year. Reagan cut taxes from 72% to 28%, two thirds. Cut regulations, as a matter of fact, revenue to the government increased because there were millions of more people working. By the fifth year of Reagan, eight million new jobs have been created in the private sector and GDP was growing at 7.2% a year. We did it in 1980, we can do it again. And let me tell you, we have a great advantage over 1980. In 1980, we didn't have internet, we didn't have email, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have Twitter, we didn't have bloggers, we didn't even have conservative radio. We have a lot of avenues today that we can go around the liberal media and get the message out to we the people. And let me tell you, we are ready to take America back. And I am extremely encouraged. I'm extremely encouraged because I see a ground swell a groundswell all across America, America of people saying, I am sick and tired of this garbage. I'm not gonna take it anymore. Amen. And so there are millions of Americans that are drawing a line in the sand and saying, we will take this country back. It's going to happen. It is going to happen and it better happen now because we don't have any more time. Now, there is nothing more than the Republican establishment would like than for constitutional conservatives or grassroots conservatives to split. If we split among two or three or four candidates, it opens a wedge for a mushy, middle of the road, stand for nothing, moderate, like Jeb Bush to get the nomination. And if Jeb Bush gets the nomination, Hillary will be our next president and this country will be destroyed. We cannot allow that to happen. Now let me tell you why I believe that Ted Cruz is the most qualified and the most viable to take that job. Not only has he been leading in all the issues, not only has he been the only one with the guts to stand against corrupt career politicians in both parties, what he's calling the Washington cartel. He's the only one that has had the guts to stand against Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and say, you're lying to the American people, you're lying to all the senators. It is about time.
time that we have politicians that become statesmen instead of politicians and that they realize that they are servants of we the people and not our masters, like many of them. Do. So Ted is really running against the Washington cartel. As I said, corrupt career politicians in both parties. This is a fight to restore power to we the people, to we the people. Because I'll tell you what, we need to send a clear message to Washington that they work for us, we don't work for them. But I'll tell you why Ted is the, more, the most viable. I think Ted is the best position to recreate the Reagan coalition. Broad spectrum support. And then let's look at viability. Do you know which was the campaign that raised the most money the first quarter that we had uh, recording, which was June 30th? It wasn't Jeb Bush, it was Ted Cruz. As of June 30th, Ted Cruz had raised $14.3 million. Second was Jeb Bush with 11 million. But here's the difference. Ted Cruz, 14.3 million, came from over 175,000 donations. Average donation, $81. Jeb Bush's 11 million, the average donation was over $900, that translates to about 12,000 donations. That's 12,000 compared to 175,000. Not only that, if you drill down in those numbers, of those 175,000 donations that Ted Cruz had, over 95% were $100 or less. That means pure grassroots. In the case of Jeb Bush, less than 3% was $200 or less. And I guess they used 200 because if they had used 100, it would have been less than 1%. So we have lots of grassroots. Bush has zero grassroots. You look at super PACs. As of June 30th, the only super PAC that had raised more money than Ted Cruz was Jeb Bush. He had raised a little over $100 million. Jeb, Ted, Ted's super PAC had raised $38 million. Nobody else even comes close. Well, the numbers for the second quarter, the quarter ending June, uh, September 30th, have not just been released. Ted Cruz raised $12.2 million from another 175,000 donors. We have over 350,000 donors now. And I'll tell you what, in the first nine days of October, another million dollars came into, into the coffers. Not only that, Ted Cruz campaign now has about 6,000 donors that are giving monthly and are covering 100% of all the overhead of the campaign to where all the money that is being raised is going to be used to campaign all across the nation. <coughs> So Ted has the money to go the course. Now, if we look at our organization, Ted Cruz has the most comprehensive organization. We have already one county chair in every county in the first four states. That's Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Nevada. What we already have county chairs in every county in those four states. We already have organizations in the ground, on the ground in all the states on March 1. We have organizations already in place in about 30 states, more than any other campaign. Now, let me tell you another huge news. David Barton now has taken over the Super PAC. Barton is a man of unquestionable integrity, a man that America highly, highly respects. I'll tell you what that does. It puts the super PAC in a totally different credibility. 
you can be assured that that super PAC is going to be run with total integrity, that you're not going to be seeing attack ads throwing mud at the other candidates. As a matter of fact, I can guarantee you, none of you have seen my son Ted speak one ale word against any of the candidates. He has stayed positive. He was the only one, every time a candidate announced, he put a press release praising them and saying something positive about them. And he will not attack any one of those. He is going to run a positive campaign, focus on the issues, focus on the difference in policy, focus on why you need to elect a constitutional conservative who will stand for the Constitution, for the rule of law, for limited government, for restoring power to the American people. If we do that, we are going to restore America to that shining city on a hill. So I'll tell you, I'm not going to speak much longer because I want for us to have a conversation. But what I want to ask you to do is this. As I said earlier, nothing more that the Republican establishment would like that for the grassroots to split among several candidates. Because if we do that, we will lose. I'm going to ask you to coalesce. Coalesce around the one candidate that is best poised to create a coalition that will take America back and will win the presidency of the United States, and that man is Ted Cruz. On every chair we put an endorsement sheet. I want to ask you to prayerfully consider and fill out that endorsement sheet. Together, if the men and women in this room can turn Minnesota, can turn America around and restore the greatness of America again. We must do that. So I'm asking you, let's coalesce around this candidate that has already the money and the organization in place, and the vision and the integrity to restore America to, again, leadership in the world, to make sure America has the strongest military on the face of the earth, because that's the only way we preserve peace. To make sure that America is respected, not laughed at across the world to make sure that people again can be proud to be Americans and to where every American can see their dreams become a reality. Where we have a government that represents all of the people. Because it should be a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. We can do that again if we elect Ted Cruz as the next, next president of the United States. So I ask you, please, fill out that endorsement sheet. Let's create a coalition that will surpass what we have in any other state. And let us, with that, erase that little blue spot that there was in the map during Reagan. Let's make it solid red. I'll tell you what, thank you for your time. I want to open it up for questions. I will answer any question you have, and we'll do that as long as you want to. Yes. Thank you, Pastor Rafael. We'll get to questions in just one moment. Uh, first, I want to introduce uh, Mandy Benz over here with the excellent T-shirt. Mandy is representing the Tech Cruise campaign this evening. If you have questions as the night goes on, please ask her. Also, those endorsement forms, she'd be very interested in those. And Mandy has, uh, is directing you right now to the uh, boxes where those, uh, those can be placed. Uh, and if you have further questions, uh, 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 the uh, Facebook page for Ted Cruz's Minnesota team is the uh, Minnesota Ted Cruz Grassroots Team. So please look that up on Facebook. Um, and let's uh, open this up for, uh, for questions. Um, yeah, Joey. Hi. Um, you talked about how much money that has been raised, but what is your bird rate? Part of the reason Scott Walker is already out is he has he was spending two million dollars a month on of the money 
Okay, I, I think I've already answered that question when I told you right now we have 6,000 donors that are covering 100% of the overhead of the campaign. So all the overhead is already covered. So all the money that is raised will be used for the campaign. We have enough money on hand to go through the first four primaries and to go through all the March 1 primaries. We are in this thing for the long haul. Anybody else? Yes. Chris Rush. Um, okay, so one thing that kind of led me to be a conservative was uh, as I began to know God more, and He really, heart, really began to, you know, grip my heart regarding the issue of abortion. And I realized that the, 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 you know, night and day of where the parties stand. Um, but then I also saw the compromise within the Republican Party, which disgusted me with um, supporting exceptions and ex supporting abortion in certain cases, which really kind of, uh, I feel like the movement's raising up, as you know, the Planned Parenthood thing. There, our generation is knowing that um, the issue of abortion, the issue of killing children, God can't bless, bless a nation that continues to do that. Uh, I really appreciate it. Mike Huckabee, when he got up and said, you know, it's time for a president to just abolish this thing like Abraham did with slavery. And so I just, I, I, I love Ted Cruz, I'm a Ted Cruz guy. Um, but I, I, I will run for the hills if I hear that he's like an exception type of candidate. And I'm just, I haven't heard him say anything about that. So I just well, he, he actually, he has said plenty about it. He has said repeatedly that he believes that life begins at conception and that every life is worth saving. As a matter of fact, I have a, a great friend that I have known for 40 years. He's a great evangelist. His name is James Robinson. James Robinson was a product of rape. His mother had been raped. She went to a doctor to get an abortion and the doctor refused to give her an abortion. That's why James Robinson is alive today. James Robinson has led over five million people to Christ in his ministry throughout his life. So every life is worth saving. But let me tell you what, Again, I said earlier, look at the record. Ever since my son was a Solicitor General of Texas, he fought in favor of parental notification. He fought to keep the ban of, on partial birth abortion that uh, Bush had put into place and that the liberals wanted to get rid of. He had to take it to Supreme Court. He has been at the forefront to not only defund but prosecute Planned Parenthood for the butchering of babies aborted alive to harvest body parts, even under today's laws, that is murder. And he has been at the forefront of the battle for life. And he just continues to lead in that area. There's no one that has taken a higher leadership position on Planned Parenthood than Ted Cruz. As a matter of fact, if it's not resolved before then, that when day, day one that Ted Cruz becomes President of the United States, Planned Parenthood will be prosecuted for because of their criminal endeavors. <laughs> and by the way, abortion is the great sin of America. Amen. Since abortion was instituted in 1973, 58 million babies have been murdered through abortion in America. You know the blood of 58 million babies cries out to God, just like the blood of Abel did. We must end this butchery. Amen. You know, it is, we need to restore a respect for life, <coughs> all human life. Michelle. Okay, uh, you said that Ted would um, rein in the uh, unelected bureaucracies. Would he get rid of all the czars? 
Well, the czars, I don't see that in the Constitution anywhere. <laughs> As a matter of the question is very simple. Ted is a strict constitutionalist. As a matter of fact, let me say something. If you look at Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, that's called the enumerated powers of Congress. There are 18 powers enumerated in Article 1, Section 8. If it ain't there, federal government's got no business being involved in it. Like, for example, you take Common Core. Well, let me tell you one word that is not in Article 1, Section 8. It's the word education. The Department of Education is unconstitutional. Should be gotten rid of. Let me tell you another word. And by the way, Common Core is not really about standards. Common Core is about control and about brainwashing our kids with secular humanism, with all these socialistic ideas that are being brainwashed to the kids. And Ted Cruz has also promised Common Core will be a same thing of the past the day he takes office. But let me tell you another word that is not in Article 1, Section 8. It's the word marriage. That decision of the Supreme Court, of that opinion, because the Supreme Court cannot render laws, they can only render opinions, on homosexual marriage, Supreme Court had no jurisdiction. All matters relating to marriage, only jurisdiction lays with the states, not with the federal government. So that opinion of the Supreme Court was totally unconstitutional also. Anybody else? Yes. Does uh, Ted Cruz have a plan to sway the moderate Democrats like Ronald Reagan did in the 80s and 84 to lean over to the more conservative bent? And well, let, let me say this. There is, I'm not going to call them moderate Democrats. There are a lot of Democrats that are what were called Reagan Democrats. They weren't really moderate Democrats. They were conservative Democrats and were Democrats because of tradition. They were Democrats because their parents voted Democrats and their grandparents voted Democrats. Even though the Democratic Party of today is not the Democratic Party of JFK. But I'll tell you something. I was in uh, New Hampshire. No, in Florida. I was in Orlando. There was a man that came to the front of the room in a meeting such as this, and he said, I've been a Democrat all my life. <clears throat> I've been a member of the Teamsters Union for 40 years. And I'm coming here to tell you that myself, my wife, and my kids, we're all voting for Ted Cruz. We're seeing that all across the nation. Let me tell you where I really see it. When Ted is doing a real large meeting, say a thousand plus, people. Typically, if he if does a big event in a city, the city will provide security because they don't want an incident. And they insist that Ted does not walk through the crowd, but that he comes through the back of the stage. I have walked through the back of the stage with Ted where there are no cameras, no media, nobody. And you see bus boys, maids, janitors stopping and holding Ted and saying, thank you for fighting for me. The grassroots is with Ted. The average American hardworking men and women of America are with Ted Cruz because Ted Cruz wants to restore dignity to them and give them the jobs and opportunity to achieve their dreams. Ted Cruz will represent every American. And I'll tell you what, that's what we need. Not special interest, but to represent every American. Anybody else? Yes. Has your son given any thought to all this murder that's going on in Chicago and the violence in Ferguson? And, um, is it unlike our president now that's given it no thought whatsoever, apparently? Well, let me say something about the violence and the racial strife that we are seeing. This thing has been fueled by this administration. You look at what happened in Ferguson. The rioters were flown in from California and from other places 
and instigated by people like Al Sharpton. It was an instigated uh, situation. Look at the difference of what happened in South Carolina where this man came into a church and killed several people. You didn't see any violence there because those people took a totally different attitude. But what happened in Ferguson, what happened in those other places, is this administration wants to create strife. Yeah. The whole concept of social justice is all about dividing everybody into a series of smaller groups, make every group seem like a victim, and just put one group against the other. They are trying to create this strife because you gotta realize that Obama is a student of Saul Alinsky. If you look at rules for radicals, Saul Alinsky said, never waste a good crisis. As a matter of fact, Saul Alinsky said, you create a crisis and then you come as the savior of the crisis, but we need crisis to make change. That is what Obama is doing and that's what Hillary Clinton will do because Hillary Clinton has been following Alinsky since she was in college. So it is created by this administration. We need to unify all Americans, stop all this concept of hyphenated Americans, and get back to we are all Americans. Well, let me say this, communism has never worked. And the reason communism has never worked is that under communism, if you work twice as hard as I do, you get paid the same as I do. So how long are you gonna do it? Before long you say, I ain't working any harder than that guy. So nobody works and the economy collapses. Let me tell you why even people are fooled by this garbage of this administration trying to restore relations with Cuba, which is a horrible deal, by the way. Let me tell you what Castro said just a few days after Obama said he would restore relations. Raul Castro said, if an American company hires a Cuban worker, that salary must be paid to the Cuban government the Cuban government will retain 92% of that money and pay the worker 8%. So what are we doing? Just fattening the fat cats while they continue to exploit the American people. That is the truth about communism everywhere. The best system of e economic system is free enterprise, where you get the government out of the way and you get people do what they do best without government interference. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, what I wanted to know is, uh, what's your son's position on the enforcement of federal drug laws in terms of states like Colorado and uh, Washington State? Because I've heard conservative arguments on both sides that you have to enforce the law in the books or that drug laws are not the enumerated powers and the federal government has no business to do it whatsoever. Well, uh, actually, I, uh, I would say this. What happens is this. Anything that is not in Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, those, those powers are restricted to the states. So that is what federalism is. Now, what is happening is this, is that actually what you have is you have the will of the people being thwarted by politicians. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you what, I was in Colorado not too long ago, and people in Colorado are telling me they are working on a referendum to have a referendum by 2016, and they tell me that drug, you know, the marijuana laws in, in Colorado are going to be repealed by a referendum in 2016. So. 
Basically, we got to follow the Constitution and the rule of law, and where there's a violation, we need to go after the violation. If we just follow the Constitution, if you just follow the laws on the books, we will be in a very solid footing. The problem is we have a government that ignores the Constitution, ignores the Declaration, ignores the rule of law, ignores separation of powers, ignores all the other branches. We got a, a president that acts by executive action without any legality whatsoever. Now he's talking about doing an executive order to put gun control because he can't push gun control. Let me tell you something about gun control. Look at history. Every tin horn dictator that has taken the guns away from the population have then used it against the population. But praise God, there are 300 million guns in America in the hands of private citizens and I don't know a single one that is willing to give those guns back to the government. <laughs> and that's what keeps us safe in America. Hi, Monty Moreno. Yes, sir. Uh, I am uh, wondering what you know about Ted's position regarding Israel. Uh, President Barack Hussein Obama said that if Israel attacked Iran over the nuclear deal, that America would actually shoot down its jets. Now, I have to believe Ted is uh, not of that persuasion. Ted is one of the strongest advocates and supporters of Israel uh, forever. I mean, he is a strong, strong supporter of Israel. Both Ted and I have spoken at Christians United for Israel in D.C. Ted speaks there every year. I spoke there this year. And uh, Ted has been to Israel already three times met with Netanyahu all three times, Ted will stand uncompromisingly for Israel. As a matter of fact, he went even to this extent. He said day one, he will begin the process to move the embassy of the United States of America to Jerusalem, the eternal capital of Israel. And I'll tell you what, the problem we have with this Iran deal is that we don't even know all the side deals that Barack Obama and John Kerry made with Iran. See, the other thing about the Iranian deal is that it gives somewhere between $100 billion to $150 billion to Iran. Much of that money is going to go to fund terrorists around the world. My son very clearly said, if this deal goes through, the U.S. government will become the biggest sponsor of terrorism in the world. Barack Obama will become the number one sponsor of terrorism in the world. As a matter of fact, Barack Obama was in Africa when Ted said that. And he said from Africa, well, Senator Cruz shouldn't be using that kind of rhetoric. <laughs> to which my son replied, truth is not rhetoric. <laughs> so my son will stand uncompromisingly for Israel. Uh, I believe that the issue of climate change was created for government control. Absolutely. And that uh, you know it's a religion of secular Democrats. As a matter of fact, did you see the the uh, question that my son had with the Sierra Club just this last week in the, in the committee, I'll tell you what. He had the president of the Sierra Club in a committee in, in the Senate. And Ted asked him, he said, now let me ask you a question. How do you justify when you keep pushing this global warming when the data proves that over the last 18 years there have been zero global warming? And this guy repeats, as a matter of fact, he first so talks to his, the guy standing behind him, and then he says this statement, well, 97% of consensus of scientists is that global warming is a reality, and we need to abide by it. And uh, then again, asked the same question. He asked it about six times, and this guy parroted the same answer. And Ted even said, look, that statement, 
was based on a study that has been proven to be a bogus story based upon falsified data. And this guy kept on, keeps on parroting the same answer. You need to Google Ted Cruz Sierra Club. It was just last week. And actually, uh, global warming is a manufactured thing. I mean, yeah. you want to take it to the extreme. What was it? It wasn't too long ago that even they, they even said, well, cow fording is causing global warming. <laughs> so even the cows are to blame. And, and as a matter of fact, the whole thing is based on bogus data. It is all about control. Has nothing to do with global warming. I'll tell you where global warming has worked. It's worked for Al Gore. Al Gore, Al Gore has become practically a billionaire pushing this garbage of global warming. But there's no reality to it. Yes. Thank you. That's, that's, Anybody that's else? Yes, back here. Yes. yes. All right. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, I agree. That's been debunked. The global warming. Absolutely. Now they call it climate change. Oh yes, because they, as a matter of fact, do you remember what was it last year that there was this ship in the Arctic to study global warming that got caught in the ice and they had to go take it out of the ice while he was studying global warming? So my question is. Yes. How will Ted counteract the climate change? Group. Now it's changing global warming to climate change and more and more people are getting on board. How would you Well, uh, what happens is this. They are trying to get the regulatory agencies to control what is happening in government. We need to cut down, like someone said, all these bureaucratic agencies that have no standing in the Constitution. We need to cut down all these control agencies like, say, the EPA, like OSHA, that all these different agencies that are trying to control and curtail the freedom of we the people. You know, if you look at the Declaration of Independence, it talks about three rights that we have from our creator. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, liberty is being constrained by all this control that they're trying to create upon us. It is an affront to our liberty, and it goes contrary to the Declaration of Independence. And by the way, while I'm on that subject, notice that the third one is the pursuit of happiness. Happiness is not a right. I'll tell you what, what Obama is trying to say is, I'll tell you what, we will take care of you from the cradle to the grave. As a matter of fact, I remember years ago that if people went on unemployment, first of all, it was shameful to go on unemployment. But if you went on unemployment, maybe it was for a week or two weeks while you paid, just burned your shoes in the pavement looking for another job. Now they say, no, you can go on unemployment for 99 weeks. You don't even have to look for a job. Oh, there's so much freedom on not working. That's garbage. <laughs> that is garbage. What we've done is destroy the entrepreneurial spirit of America. You obtained your dreams by hard work and perseverance. That means you not, don't give up. You keep working hard at it. And I'll tell you what, anybody who's done that has achieved their dreams. That's the greatness of America. And what Obama is doing is trying to destroy that and makes us serve of the government. There was a question over here, yes. Let's do uh, one last uh, question here. We'll yes. Finish. Okay, um, so a lot of critics, like Rand Paul said a week, weeks ago that uh, uh, that Ted Cruz's career in the Senate was dismal, that no one was willing to work with him anymore. And that's kind of been a big uh, thing I get from conservatives when I say, hey, I'm for Ted Cruz, they're like, well, he's not gonna be able to get the other side to work with him. So I just want to know your response to that. All right, let me just say this. Without attacking anybody, I'm not going to attack any candidate. But let me tell no, I will not attack any candidate. But let me just say this. The, the Democrats' idea of compromise is you agree with the Democrats, you play dead and agree with 100% of what they want to do. That's how Democrats define compromise. Let me tell you something. Look at the model of Ronald Reagan. 
When Ronald Reagan took over as president, the Democrats <coughs> controlled the House. Tip O'Neill was Speaker of the House. How did, how did Reagan handle Tip O'Neill? Not by giving up, by going above Tip, Tip O'Neill to we the people. Reagan said, I have a mandate, and if we have a mandate from we the people, the Democrats are going to fall in line. So what we need is a mandate from we the people. And we need to speak directly to the American people and have the will of the American people be what dictates what politicians do instead of the other way around, where the will of the politicians are trying to thwart the will of the people. That is not what America is. We need to restore America to where the will of the people is what prevails and where politicians have their ears tuned to what is the will of the people. You know something, let me tell you, last year, during the uh, August recess, there's a month recess in the Senate. Now, some people think that's a month vacation for the Senate. I don't know for other senators, but my son did 37 meetings in Texas during that month. A series of town hall meetings talking to his constituents about what do they want? What is it that they want me to represent them in? To find out what the will of the people was. That's what every politician should be doing. Finding out the will of the people and representing the will of the people. Thank you very much. God bless you. God bless America. Please, please, please fill out those endorsement forms. Help us to put together a coalition. Let's make Minnesota the greatest coalition that Ted has in any state in the union. You can do it in this room. Let's do it together and let's take America back because America deserves to be the best in the world again. Thank you. God bless you.